Welcome back to those of you who were in the session. My name is Professor Grafton White and I'm the director of the Namibia Business School. The title for our session is Giganomics, a toolbox for gig entrepreneurs. Let's get started today. We're going to, re uh, we're going to start our session by just recapping the things that uh, what we picked up on the first session. When we talked about uh, giganomics and it being defined as understanding we work in the post coronavirus economy where many people have to learn how to, firstly, work as gig entrepreneurs and not employees. Uh, gig entrepreneurs are people working on gig type assignments, maybe short term, long term, but maybe not full time employ uh, in full time employment. They, Similarly, they may be in full-time employment, but doing some kind of a gig entrepreneurial exercise. We'll have to learn to embrace the uncertainty of the gig economy, and it will be very uncertain as certainty of bandwidth as well. Uh, we need to work with a portfolio of gigs. It, uh, having one stream of income is no longer going to be uh, the norm, I think. Uh, and derive and learn to derive the main source of income from gig working. Again, uh, CVs will, will no longer be a record of time spent, but a record of great performances. We talked about design thinking, and uh, we talked about the five areas of design thinking last week. We talked about empath uh, empathizing, where we got into the minds and, and thinking, uh, looking at a problem from the point of view of a customer, and we said that the next stage of that was at, at some point to de clearly define, in writing preferably, defining the problem and that you're trying to solve. Important, because if you don't write it down, you will tend to lose focus or shift focus. And then once we've defined the problem, we ideate. We go into a process or into a stage of uh, uh, brainstorming, idea uh, generation, to try and find solutions that will address the specific problem that we defined. Once we're in that stage, we prototype. We talked about prototyping with fast and furious, lots of different pro, uh, different uh, solutions. Select one, test it, see whether it works. If it works, we go with it. If it doesn't work, we ditch it. We fail fast, we fail hard, and we get rid of things that don't work. Uh, so we don't spend a huge amount of money on testing ideas, but we move along quickly. If it works, then we upscale and, and, and use the uh, go into production, so to speak, with the idea. Then we also talked about design thinking application, what, uh, what uh, it, design thinking looks like, how do we apply it. Uh, uh, we apply it, uh, or the application of it is for, uh, for creating a new product or service by solving a problem, improving or refocusing an existing product or service that we might have on board, and thirdly, uh, diversifying into a new product or service uh, uh, from uh, something that we already have on board. The advantages allows us to solve real problems as perceived by the customer. It's agile, it's quick, it's inexpensive approach. We fail fast, ditch quickly or upscale. Today, however, we are going to focus on operations, the second part of uh, this uh, this pie diagram that we've set, uh, we've uh, introduced you to right at the beginning of the the, uh, the course, and the second stage is operation. We've said that these are the the six key areas for any entrepreneur, and specific for gig entrepreneur in this uh, post coronavirus uh, environment. The tool that we're going to introduce you to today is the value chain, value chain analysis. I want to introduce you to a poll, and I'd like to uh, um, give me your responses to this. The question is on this poll, what is a value chain? I want to see how many of us have actually been introduced to this particular uh, concept. And in front of you, you should see a, a poll with three answers. It's saying that uh, a value chain is either A, a physical restraint on achieving value in the business, B, a breakdown of business activities needed to create a product or service, or C, a puzzle which business people have to sort out to make a profit. Let me have your answers, please.
Okay. Okay, so it's still going through, uh, but 89% of everyone chose B. So a breakdown of business activities needed to create a product or service. 89%. Excellent. Yes. That's exactly what it is. It's a breakdown of business activities needed to create a product or service. Let me close that. Thank you. I'm seeing 2% at a, a physical restraint, 18 of you or 90% break down business activities and no one chose the last, the latter. That's fine, thank you, I'm closing that. Thank you for that response. And it, that is very much what it is. A value chain is a way of creating values and breaking down activities, business activities to uh, create a product or service and creating value from that product or service. What I'm gonna show you now is a very short video that will just uh, describe a, a very simple value chain. And then I'm gonna go from there, from this very simple idea to a more sophisticated idea and, and explain in more detail what the value chain is this uh, this particular model will show you uh, as like i said a very simple idea it will have some gaps but it will it, it will it will serve a purpose let me just start this hi my name is joe startup and i'm here to help you start up simply simply start up let's discuss the value chain recently my friend josie told me she had this great product and wants to start a business she felt overwhelmed by everything that needs to be done and not sure where to start. I always start with a simple question and then break the, the business down into pieces to make it easier to understand. Let's explore. The simple question is, does the business create value? Value or profit is selling a product or service for more than it costs to make. More money comes in than goes out. The difference is called a profit. If you can sell something for five and it costs you two to make, then that's a good business with $3 profit. There were a whole chain of events to create the product. Break down a business into its four simplest processes. Develop, make, tell, sell. Develop is inventing a solution for a need. Make is actually producing the product. Tell is letting your customers know about the product benefits. Sell is getting customers to buy your product. Value is created if you can sell for more than it costs to produce. We draw out a value chain to understand the actions needed to start a business. Also, you can focus on the combination of the most valuable chain links and what you're best at. Find someone else to do or outsource the links you're not good at and have lower value work. Here's a simplified example of breaking down a business into the develop, make, tell, and sell processes. Let's say you go to the store and buy an outfit for $100. In the develop step, the company designed the clothes from an in-house designer or an outside design firm for $5. In the make stage, the company paid an outside factory to make the clothes for $20. In the tell stage, the company hired a marketing agency to create splashy ads for $20. In the sell stage, the company allowed for retailers to make $50 to stock and sell the clothing. That adds up to $95. If the product sells for $100, then the clothing company made a $5 profit. Now break your business down into a value chain. Create four boxes and label develop, make, tell, and sell. Describe how each will be done. You tell the story of your value chain. Think about where you're gonna get the raw materials if it is a product, how the product will get made, how will you get the message out, and how you will sell to the customer. Which step do you create the most value, the least value? Can it be outsourced? Don't worry if there are parts you don't know. Put a question mark by the step. The goal of the exercise is to think through all the parts of your business. Here we are in the Joe Startups Essential Documents. Thank you, we'll stop at that point. And the essence of the, the video was to focus on uh, its four stages, develop the product idea, make it, sell it, and tell, and tell people about it. Very, simple, uh, very simplistic and very uh, useful as a start point, but 
really it, doing business is a little bit more complicated than that. So what I want to do is introduce you to a value chain uh, of uh, Professor Michael, Michael Porter, who developed this value chain uh, idea, uh, which has revolutionized the way that we think about business uh, across corporate, uh, across corporations all over the world. He came out with this idea in 1985 in a book, uh, Competitive Advantage. And it, his value chain, though is a, a little bit more complicated than the one that we saw, but actually is quite simple in its, its, its thinking. Very simply, if you look at the bottom half of this value chain, this is where the focus is, and this is the parallel with the value chain that we saw in the simplistic model. He talked about inbound logistics. That means bringing the raw materials into the organization. And then the operations is where you make the finished goods. Then he argued that there's an outbound logistics. So all the logistics about getting the product to the customer. Then the, th uh, uh, the fourth area is the sales and marketing. So marketing, uh, uh, this is very much the tell and sell of the, the simplistic model, but marketing your product to letting people know and sales where you cement the transaction or the deals that sells the or finished products to the customer. And then he brings in this uh, uh, lasso element in the, the value chain, which is service. Typically after sales service, how you keep the customer engaged with uh, the, the product and use that as an opportunity to resell and uh, sell more products to the customer. If the value chain had a, a, a number of significant uh, uh, key ideas that it, it pervaded. First of all, it made a clear distinction between primary activities and support activities. We'll come to talk about support activities later. Secondly, um, he identified that primary activities contribute directly to the, the costs and value of the, the finished product. So the direct cost and value to the finished product are in your primary activities. Thirdly, it provided a visual model and allowed you to target your particular market and increase your product, your product, mar uh, product margins yeah, or profit margins, sorry. So it allowed you to increase your profit margins by focusing on specific, uh, specific activities within the primary activities of your business. And the fourth thing was that it focused on what is your unique selling point or the value proposition of your products. These were the big ideas that came from the value chain. What I want to do in here is just do a simple gap analysis now between the, the simplistic model and the uh, Porter model of the, of the value chain. Again, just to emphasize that that simplistic model, there were gaps in it. First thing you got in on the simple value chain, we talked about develop, make, tell, and sell. Looking at the primary activities of the Porter value chain, we talked about inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales and service. And if you then bridge the gap between them, you see where the gaps are. So develop was very much the inbound logistics. What's the raw materials? What are the ideas that you, you need to bring in play to make up your, your product? They talked about the make of, the, uh, of your product, how you, the operations, uh, that equates to the operations. And Outbound logistics didn't really cover that in the simplest model, but that's really important. How do you get your product to the customer? Very important. Then the tell and the sell that was picked up in the simple, that's your marketing and sales, but also again in the simple uh, value chain, it only it, it omitted to speak about the service element and the service element that we know today is critically important to any uh, product or anything that you're selling, um, any business opportunity, a business idea, if you fail to understand the service that you're delivering to your customer, you're gonna miss out great portions of value. So we're gonna move on in our uh, thinking, working with the value chain, the portal value chain, which is the real value chain.
Okay, so uh, what adds value to your product? Porter's thinking was that we should look to reduce costs and increase value that will increase our profit. So either you, uh, you either you look at your activities and look how you can reduce costs in, against those activities or look to increase value in those activities and either of those, act either of those uh, approaches will increase your profit. If we focus on reducing cost, then we are taking a cost leadership strategy is what he argued. If we're focusing on increasing our value part of the equation, then he suggests that that is a strategy call for differentiation, where we have to differentiate our product uh, from the competitors to increase the value. So these are the two generic strategies that Porter uh, thought of. At this point, I'd like us to, to go into another poll question. And uh, I want you to think of companies that use either a a cost leadership strategy or b a differentiation strategy yeah so companies that focus on minimizing costs or others that focus on differentiating their products i.e., increasing value as a competitive advantage i'd like you to use the i know i called it a poll question but i'd like you to use your chat to respond to this poll question give us some companies that you think fits within either of those uh, two models. Give me some companies. I'm going to go on to the chat and see responses I'm getting. Let's let's get some responses. Okay. Now. Um, I'm seeing as a, a cost a, a cost reduction strategy. I'm seeing Aldi from from or Lidl from Leon. Um, cost leadership Walmart. That is from Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah, that's uh, very much so. Walmart very much on the cost leadership strategy. Uh, Christo is suggesting Shoprite. Very much a, a cost leadership. Forgetting about quality, just costs. Reduce the costs. I would agree. Um, B uh, uh, a a differentiation strategy for MTC. Um, yeah, they're not trying. They're definitely not trying to go at a uh, at cost leadership. They are quite expensive, but they are very strong in differentiating their their product in the marketplace. Thank you, uh, uh, Alfonso, for that. Uh, Simba Apple. That's very much a, a differentiating strategy there. Thank you. Lumber City. That's cost leadership. I don't know Lumber City, but you probably have to describe that one for us, Gideon. But it sounds, it sounds, uh, uh, um, thank you for that contribution. Uh, again, another Apple, Google this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for all those. Hey, Wakitu is saying that uh, uh, FMB is following a cost leadership strategy. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Lau is saying Woolworths is uh, also following a cost leadership strategy. Thanks for that. Thanks for that input. Uh, everybody and the last one there from from Charlton um, talks about MTC and clicks as differentiators and uh, Hendrina talking about PEP and uh, and uh, as a cost leadership with again FMB also seen as a differentiator not just the cost leader thank you very much everybody for for that input I put up a couple of examples here uh, uh, in Namibia, we have a company called Nakara, which sells high-end leather goods, very high-end. So it's like very much a differentiator, uh, uh, the way it's positioned itself in the market. And of course, the ubiquitous Apple. On the cost leadership side, we have Mr. Price, who sell clothing and, and aim to sell uh, a low cost clothing um, at reasonably average quality. Um, and of course, McDonald's. McDonald's definitely follows a low price strategy or cost leadership strategy, not low price, cost leadership strategy. So let's look at the value chain and let's, uh, uh, I'm going to go through an example and, and see it in operation and understand how we can use the value chain analysis in our businesses. First example we're going to use is McDonald's. 
and we'll follow it through, follow through the value chain and see how it's used at McDonald's. First thing that we need to define is that the mission of McDonald's is to provide customers with low price food items. The value proposition, as we've already said, is one of cost leadership. The key processes and systems uh, that they use to develop the product and service are in our primary uh, and, and support, well, in our primary activities, and the support activities are the ones that support the product. This is, a, a, let's go back to the value chain and let's see at the bottom half of the value chain, we've got these primary activities. Now, the primary activities, remind ourselves here, are inbound logistics, i.e. The, the bringing together the, the raw materials to create our products, operations, where we convert the products, convert the raw materials into products, outbound logistics is where we get our products to our customers, marketing sales, where we make our customers aware of our products and uh, uh, negotiate those sales, and after a service, that we uh, apply and um, create, a, uh, create a added value on the products through service. Let's just follow this through. So the inbound logistics, pre-selected low cost suppliers for raw materials for those hamburgers that McDonald's produce. Operations, the operation model is where they can take those products, they cook them and provide them to the customer. Most of this, this operation is done through a franchise model, a franchising model, uh, where a uh, franchise is where a, a license is given to a third party, probably business people like yourself, to produce the products according to a strict uh, uh, processes and, and strict model that uh, McDonald's um, defines and, and, and impo not imposes, but defines and shares with its franchisees. Uh, the whole pro process is about producing fast foods at low cost. And they've got very, very clear uh, methodology for doing that. So that's your operations. Then your outbound logistics, very simple idea. You can do it takeaway or a fast casual restaurant idea. This is what McDonald's does. They either do takeaway or they do a, a sit down restaurant, but they don't make a, a, a that's not the, the sit down restaurant, even though you pay a premium for that, that's not their main business. That's not the main focus of their business. Then the fourth area was the marketing and sales. And then we see the golden arches as, as uh, uh, McDonald's would like to call their, their big yellow M in the print media and, um, and social media they have a very distinctive brand that is uh, uh, shared throughout their marketing and sales and the visual branding of their packaging and the restaurants all contribute to this marketing of the, of the McDonald's brand and the way that they sell their products and finally the services they focus on counter service self-service, drive-through service uh, as a way of adding value to the product. It's fast, it's friendly, and it's McDonald's. On the support activities, which I haven't said much about up until this point, but let me just unpack it for you. The, uh, the support activities are uh, four, four that uh, were identified by Michael Porter. First of all, the firm infrastructure, so the head office, all of that, that uh, office structures that support the business. Then a uh, human resource management. So this is the recruitment and training of staff. Technology development, a lot of IT, a lot of technology has been used within McDonald's and, uh, um, and procurement. And what this one, the uh, procurement is the sort of mass buying, the, the, the ability to buy, uh, uh, to, 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 to buy on a large scale and this is done centrally uh, through their procurement houses. One of the things that uh, uh, led Michael Porter to develop the value chain was this idea that uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, companies in the 80s were spending lots of money on support activities with the intention of building the business and making the business more profitable. 
And a lot of uh, uh, vanity projects uh, on reflection now, vanity projects like, you know, spending a lot of money on building, rebuilding the head office structures and rebuilding uh, uh, big uh, 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 head office infrastructure. And that was justified as a way of, again, supposedly adding value to the whole business and uh, um, sold to shareholders on the basis that it will, in the long run, it will make the company more pr profitable. And there are a lot of these uh, ideas floating around during the 80s. Uh, again, um, the technology, lots of multi-million dollar technology projects that were launched in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, in the attempt to say, to create and add value to the products. And he wanted to identify where were the real sources of value add. So moving on and staying with our ex example of McDonald's, the firm infrastructure, we got very plush, uh, sophisticated looking uh, 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 firm head office uh, 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 infrastructure, uh, where the franchise management, branding, marketing, legal people, financial planners, etc., all housed in these head office structures. Human resource management, where uh, uh, the direct employees of McDonald's are kept to a minimum and there is centralized training to make sure that everybody knows the McDonald's way of doing things. Technology, technology is now uh, not just in the head office and, and uh, in, the, in the areas that are, were invisible to the customer. Now they've brought a lot of technology uh, uh, right up into the outlets or the, the the shops, the McDonald's shops or the McDonald's restaurants, I should put more properly, more correctly, and where people are able to order their using touch screen, uh, automate uh, their orders and uh, um, as they come in and swipe on their, their credit card, doing everything themselves. And by the time they've walked from the the ordering machine, to the counter, their food should be ready. At least in theory, that's how it should work. And then finally, the procurement, the logistics and procurement side, yes, McDonald's has a huge uh, um, uh, buying power. So they buy centrally and they can buy effectively at a, a fairly low cost because of their supply chain uh, uh, muscle and their logistics operations. So that's procurement. So large requirements, approved long-term supplier relationships, uh, excellent planning and forecasting allows them to uh, uh, have a very strong presence in the market, transparency and sustainability in their practices and a detailed supply chain management process. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, put the, the value chain, the classical value chain as it applies to McDonald's. But now let's try it out. Let's see if we run our own business, if we take a, 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 one of our small businesses and apply the principles there, what does that look like? How would it look? Imagine one of your side hustles or one of your gigs is to run a bakery, a home cake bakery, and this is your business idea. This is what we're going to use as a, a vehicle to test this value chain thinking. So. Imagine this is you. I want, as we go through this, that uh, you uh, think about the various parts of the value chain. Uh, this uh, young lady is uh, uh, Maria Bacanjola, is a, a pioneering British entrepreneur, British Nigerian entrepreneur, who has developed a highly successful online baking school. So applaud it to Maria, but I need you to think about it for yourself. What could you do as we go through the, ne the, the next stages or the various uh, uh, slides tell me uh, have a think about what could you do to reduce costs or add value in each of the stages as we go through and i want you to to make a note and uh, when we get to uh, uh, three or four slides down there i'm going to ask you to put these up on the chat so what could you do to reduce costs or add value just a reminder here, 
of the primary activities in the value chain. Inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, service, as we apply them to our cake making business. First of all, in, inbound logistics, we collect the supply of ingredients, baking equipment, etc., uh, from wholesalers and bakery suppliers using our own car. So we go around in, in our car to buy these various ingredients. We then take these ingredients home and we mix them all together in a way that, magical way that it's done. I'm not much, uh, I, I'm not an expert on cake baking, so some of you there will have to instruct me. And uh, we put it all together and out pops these great cake creations. Then uh, the third step that we we do is, is as our outbound logistics, the way that we get the product to the customer is that we deliver these products in our backy, in our bucky to the customer. So we take the cake, we box them up and we deliver them to, to the, the customer. In the fourth step, we do our marketing and sales and the way that we're doing it, we're saying, okay, we're promoting our, uh, our business on Facebook and Instagram and we've also set up a website. So these are the things that we're doing uh, to, to promote our, our product. And clearly people that come, when we hand over the cake, we get our payment. So that's where the sales takes place. And we introduce services, we just introduce the idea of phone, that people can phone us to order their cakes. And if they're repeat customers, we will take payment at the time when we deliver, or if they're new customers, they have to pay up front and you would get a direct debit, or no, a, a credit transfer into our bank account to uh, before the order. So this is what this is how we do it at the moment. How could we, or what could we uh, we do to reduce costs and add value for our sweet cakes business? In each of those steps, reflecting on each of those steps, how what do you think we could do to either reduce costs or to add value? Please share with me in the uh, the chat. What do you think we could do to? That's our business. That's the way we do it at the moment. What could we do? Give me some ideas of what we could do to reduce costs or add value. Give me some chats. I'm looking. I'm looking for ideas. Okay, I'm, I, I'm seeing one or two coming through. Some ideas coming through. How can we reduce costs or add value? We're using our bucky to go and buy the raw materials. We are cooking the things in our, in our kitchen in, at home. We are delivering the, the cakes to our, our customers. Again, in our own uh, buggy, our own cars, um, and the, the sales and marketing, we're using our website and Instagram and Facebook to advertise. And we also, as a, a, a service aspect, we're taking telephone orders. Good, thank you. Okay, so, what potential, what ways could we reduce costs or add value? We're saying that one of the, the ideas that's coming through is that we could uh, get the customer to collect the, the cakes themselves. That's great. Any, any further ideas coming through? That one seems to be an obvious one. Uh, we, we would take a credit card payments. Okay, that would help. Thank you. Okay. So again, remind ourselves what the primary activities, inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing, sales and service. You're gonna be able to recite these very quickly as we, by the time we've left this, this session. First of all, on the inbound logistics, we could 
arrange for bulk supply of the ingredients. We could find ourselves a supplier who could could uh, uh, deliver these or deliver these these supplies to us on in larger quantities rather than us going down to the supermarket and and buying them ourselves. We could get these delivered. It might be uh, if we buy them in larger a bulk, we could actually get them cheaper. So there would be a, a, a potential for cost savings in the inbound logistics. On our operations, instead of baking cakes for everything, at the moment we are, we, we, any, any order that we get or any, for any requirement, we will, we will service it. Small cakes, large cakes, fat cakes, round cakes, whatever, we will bake those cakes. There is a, a, a potential for specialization. Um, we could specialize in birthday cakes and wedding cakes only. If we've got sufficient business coming through on that, and we could charge it, we could reduce our costs by focusing just on those types of cakes. Or it could be another area of specialization. So specialization is one way of us reducing costs by not uh, um, diluting uh, diluting our, our um, activities or our operation, trying to do everything and be all things to, to all people. Another way in the outbound logistics, and, and that was mentioned by one or two of you, is that uh, instead of us delivering the cake to the customer, um, we could get the customer to collect the cake themselves, collect their orders. That's nice, they could do that. I've asked the rest that because I want to come back to that point later on marketing and sales we could outsource our marketing and sales because marketing and sales marketing now especially managing uh, 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 social media and using it very optimally is actually quite a specialized area now so we may not be enthusiastic enthusiastic users of social media so it may uh, benefit us to outsource that part of our activities to someone, um, maybe even our younger children who are probably better at it than us, um, or outsource it to a professionals. You pay for that service, uh, um, but you may find that in the long run, it adds more value because you're able to generate more sales and attract more customers. On this last one, a different uh, uh, on the service, platform here there's some real opportunity there's some real opportunities here real opportunities to to um, not just reduce costs but to differentiate our product from the competition how so And this is where I, I, I ask the risk, the, the customer clicks. You might argue that if we, we if we deliver the, the orders to the customer and, and we're specializing on birthday cakes, let's say, we might be in a, a position to create a customer experience, as a CX, customer experience by offering a costume service, let's say. So if the child uh, or whoever the, the child children's birthday they like particular kind of cartoon characters we could dress up in the cartoon character deliver the cake actually in the birthday by their uh, dressed up as their favorite cartoon character what does this do this allows us to differentiate our product and charge a premium so it's a value add a way to add value to the product and charge a premium on on the product and create uh, additional profit by offering this extra service. We may also decide that we want to offer photographic mementos. So have not only does Spider-Man turn up to deliver their cake, dressed as Spider-Man, um, we might have a photograph taken with Spider-Man on their 10th birthday um, and again, charge a, 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 an extra premium on our, 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 for the product. The cake remains the same, but by this extra service, we're able to charge a, a premium. And as we collect more and more customers, we can have a reminder service. You know, people tend to have the birthdays on the same day every year. 
So there's an opportunity to continue to resell a service and uh, at different stages. So uh, on different anniversaries as uh, um, over time. So having this reminder service will will help us to stay ahead of our customers and stay ahead of 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 um, the market in that respect. So if we put all of these things together, we can see our very sophisticated or a very simple uh, cake baking operation it can become something quite sophisticated, creating a unique customer experience for which they will pay a premium and increase our profits. On the support activities, again, the emphasis here on the support activities is that they typically add costs to the operation, but they can also increase value but not directly, these are indirect costs and indirect value add because support activities typically support more than one product line. Yeah? Primary activities support a particular product, support activities support can support one or more product lines because they're generic activities. So, Again, if we just follow through, the firm's infrastructure is home-based. It's one woman or one person, might be a man. And there's different types of cakes or different types of products that are being created in this single, uh, in this single firm. So again, it is a cost that cuts across different product lines. The human resource, uh, uh, training and, and uh, uh, Assistance can help expand the business, but in the for early instances, it's, a, it's an added cost to the existing product line. Technology, technology for to that you could be using to um, for for credit card payment or cash payment or EFT payments, all come at a fee, and they can be used across multiple product lines. Similarly, procurement, you could have an account with your local wholesalers or um, and, um, local uh, bakery suppliers. Again, um, if your an account will have uh, will have a cost implication with it to hold an account with with those uh, typical uh, outlets. So what we're saying here, when your analysis of the support activities, we're saying that. There are opportunities and firm for outsourcing bookkeeping. Like there's uh, opportunities for mentoring or recruiting, um, opportunities in the technology for payment systems and negotiating uh, a favorable uh, rates or uh, services with, across procurement. But these are indirect costs or indirect uh, uh, value that you're able to, to generate. So what are the advantages of the value chain? The value chain allows us to distinguish between primary and secondary activities. I hope that's come across. It should have. I've repeated it a lot of times, but again, I'm just repeating it here. It allows you to distinguish between primary and secondary activities. Primary activities are direct costs and value items associated with the product or the service that you're delivering. Yeah? It's a direct cost and you allocate those costs to individual products. Secondary activities are indirect and can support one or more products. It's easier to identify cost leadership or, or differentiation strategies uh, and, and increase product, uh, increase profits, pardon me, by using the value chain to break down your uh, your product or your service into these discrete areas, yeah, inbound, uh, and, and the primary activities are your inbound logistics where your raw materials are brought into your operations and converted your operations into finished products, which are also then uh, uh, delivered to your customers. You do your marketing and sales, and you think about the service and the value added service that you can bring into the product to add value to the whole product or service 
and charge a premium. And the value chain works if you are delivering or if you are making products like cakes or you're uh, delivering a service like a hairdressing service, it's exactly the same thing. Instead of uh, raw materials, the raw materials are actually the people who come in for their hair cut or get their hair done. The process, the operations is the process where you 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 uh, go through and you do the hairstyle. The um, it 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 you, you co-work with the person to create to the delivery of the project or the outbound uh, logistics, if you like, and the marketing and sales can be done on social media, through the website, etc., or in the newspapers. And the value-added service could be that, that you offer cakes, free food, free snacks in the salon, or there are other add-on benefits, like you could offer, uh, uh, while they're waiting, they could offer a massage service or nail uh, service or whatever. So it, 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 it also works with services as well as products. A summary. In this session, we learned about the activities in a value chain. We learned about the differences between primary and support activities. We also learned how to break our business idea down into those primary and support activities to allow us to analyze those individual activities and allow us to extract either cost reductions. Uh, opportunities or value-add opportunities uh, in, in the various activities of our value chain. What are our next steps? Next steps is practice. There's some, we, in the notes that you'll be given, there are some background reading and uh, for you to, to familiarize yourself with the, the value chain uh, concept more closely. What we say here, and as we said last week, the way to use this most effectively is to practice, reflect on usage, and to, to, to keep working with it. It is a very, very powerful tool to help you to begin to break down your business uh, opportunity, which you created last week from the design thinking. Now it allows you to break it down into discrete, activities and being able to analyze and reflect on those activities to extract the maximum value out of those activities for your particular business. Um, I remind you that our Facebook uh, forum is there for further discussion and uh, uh, for interaction with each other and our next session will look at human capital how to harness the energy of others and to realize your own vision. So if there are any burning questions, you can throw it into the Q&A. Otherwise, I will uh, bring this particular session to a close, this webinar to a close, and invite you to log into our Facebook and leave your comments there. Thank you very much for attending this week. And I look forward to engaging with you further in the next session. Thank you very much. Bye.